thanks for the invitation. And um, so hello everyone, my name is Samuel and I'm from Wales Fargo today. I'm very excited to share with the topic of hybrid quantum classical machine learning and applications. In this presentation, uh, we will explore the potential of quantum computing in conjunction with the machine learning techniques to solve certain kinds of problems. And we will also discuss the practical applications of this technology and uh, how it can benefit various industries. So let's get started. So this is uh, today's um, agenda. So uh, first we will motivate the, uh, why we study these um, techniques and fields. And then I will introduce the basic concepts of quantum computing and quantum machine learning. And I will focus on various applications such as classification, sequential learning, reinforced learning, and the natural language process. Finally conclude the, this talk. So the machine learning in general has gained very significant attention since the success of AlphaGo in 2016. And um, this demonstrate that machine learning, especially the, the reinforced learning can solve complex sequential decision-making problems. On the other hand, <coughs> the field of quantum computing has seen significant hardware advancements since 2017 with notable companies such as IBM, Google, and the D-Wave making significant progress. So the quantum company has been shown to solve certain computational problems with performance superior to classical computers. So we can ask the question, or can we combine the best parts from both classical machine learning and QC to solve even more complex problems? So here is the uh, roadmap uh, for IBM, and they they already uh, released their state of the art 433 qubit machine last November, and they prepare to uh, send out more uh, higher uh, quantum volume devices in the future, and this is one. Um, and there are several other companies as well. So we can expect that many potential quantum uh, applications will be very important and benefit. So this is the outline of um, the, the research items that I will probably cover this in this talk. I work on um, mostly in the reinforcement field and I also work on some several supervised machine learning things. Uh, probably the unsupervised quantum machine learning is the thing that I haven't explored yet. Okay, so uh, let's start from some quantum computing basics. So as you may know, classical computers using classical bits, and each bit can only store zero or one. However, in the quantum computers, the, the basic memory storage is called the quantum bits. And for each qubit, we can store the uh, linear superposition of state zero and one simultaneously up to um, alpha and the beta amplitude. And alpha and beta are complex numbers. Another very important thing in the quantum computing is that we have quantum entanglements. And the quantum entanglement is a very unique property in the quantum physics. No analog in the classical computer has been found. Based on these simple um, ideas, uh, famous quantum algorithms such as Shor's algorithms and Grover's algorithms have been proposed. And these are the uh, probably the most famous one. And when we say that, oh, some, something has quantum supremacy, probably we, we refer to the Shor's algorithm, for example, because it can break the state of the art public key cryptography. But designing a quantum algorithm is a non-trivial task. And this task is even harder in the existing noisy quantum machines. So the Shor's algorithm and Grover's algorithm usually require fault tolerance, 
and uh, quantum computer with a large number of qubits. So uh, that's uh, very, very difficult and critical now. So the basic idea in the quantum computing uh, includes some quantum states, for example, and uh, usually we use the broad kit annotation to represent a quantum state. For example, the, the, the uh, I cannot hear you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Designing a quantum algorithm is a non trivial mm -hmm. task. And this task is even harder in the existing noisy quantum machine. So the short algorithm and gross algorithm usually require for tolerance for a uh, quantum computer with a large number of qubits. So uh, that's uh, very, very difficult and critical now. So the basic idea in the quantum campaign uh, includes uh, quantum states, for example, and uh, usually we use the broad kit annotation to represent a quantum state. For example, the... the uh, 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 I cannot hear you. Okay. Okay, so let's continue. And Okay, so uh, we use the bracket notation to represent the quantum state. And um, for example, the zero state can be represented as a column vector, one zero. And the, the, uh, the transpose of this uh, state uh, is one zero in the row vector. And we can construct the density matrices. And there are several important quantum operations. Uh, what we will need today is the X, Y, Z, and H. And um, the quantum circuit diagram reads from uh, left to right. So for example, if we have a quantum state starting from zero and we, op uh, we uh, put a poly X state on it, and we, we can write it in the matrix Form, such as the, the, the two by two matrices and representation for X and operate on the column vector. And we will find that it will transfer the zero state to one state. And then we talk about the, the parameter rise operations. And we will use these uh, unitary rotations for most of the machine learning tests that we will discuss. So the idea is that we can use three rotation angles to parameterize a rotation gate. And this rotation gate R will rotate a particular quantum state on the block sphere. We can also consider the Rx, Ry, and Rz rotation gate uh, rotating uh, along uh, x, y, z axis. And another very important quantum gate is the two qubit Sina gate. So the Sina gate will operate between two qubits and there is a control qubit and a target qubit. For example, if the control qubit is zero, it will not have any uh, do anything on the target qubit. However, if the control qubit is one, then it will have um, the you would uh, uh, flip the target qubit from zero to one or one to zero. So uh, then we talk about the uh, quantum machine learning and the quantum machine learning can be categorized into four categories based on the algorithms and the data they process. The categories include uh, the CC, uh, classical data, and the classical algorithm. 
this category is not considered quantum machine learning, but we include it here for completeness. The CQ, the classical data, and the quantum algorithm. So this category is a hot topic recently. As most of the data we have are classical. And we hope that there are quantum algorithms that can help us deal with the increasing complexity and volume of the data. The QC, the quantum data, and the classical algorithm. So sometimes this category refers to the subject called machine learning for quantum physics, which uses classical machine learning to study quantum phenomena. For example, if you use a classical convolutional neural network to to study quantum phase transition, for example, then it's in the QC area. And the QQ, the quantum data and the quantum algorithm. <clears throat> so this category is the most difficult one as both parts are not yet fully understood. In this presentation, we'll focus on the CQ category of quantum machine learning, which has the most practical applications for industries to deal with large data sets. And uh, for the QML, uh, we will uh, use this hybrid quantum classical paradigm. So this paradigm is suitable for currently available NISQ devices, noise, uh, noisy intermediate scale quantum devices. The idea is that certain part of the calculations are performed on the quantum computer, while the optimization procedure is carried out on a classical computer. So within this framework, we can easily apply the optimization method developed in the classical machine learning community for very complex architectures, such as the ones I will describe later. We can uh, use both the, the real quantum devices or some uh, high performance quantum simulation software. One of the most popular example in quantum machine learning is the variational quantum circuits. And actually this is the, um, the building block of many, many uh, hybrid quantum classical machine learning architectures. So it consists of three components. The first, the U of X is the encoding part. And this circuit involves mapping a classical data into a quantum state that can be processed by a quantum computer. And then the variational circuit part, the V of theta. This component is responsible for finding the best set of parameters for a quantum circuit that will be used to classify data or do any inference or, or clustering, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, we have the measurement. The quantum state is measured to obtain the class, class classical values. And the result from the measurements will then be fed back into the classical computer for further processing. Or you can use the, the these uh, measured values as the input into another quantum circuit and do a lot of different things. And so let's have a very, very basic example of the parameterized or variational quantum circuit. So imagine that you have a, a quantum state starting from zero and you uh, uh, perform a quantum action, quantum operation uh, Ry of phi. So we can represent this as a matrix form. So that's what you, um, so when you say uh, write this expression in the Kursky, in the Pendulant, or any other quantum simulation, usually uh, they will perform this uh, matrix multiplication. So this is the most uh, um, uh, direct way to do this. And there are other uh, ways to simplify large qubit computations, but let's use this one for example. And uh, the phi is a parameter. So you can, change it and usually we consider a very small infinitesimal amount delta phi. So if we add this, then we can uh, change the rotation a little bit. So that's how the parameterized or variational works. Okay, and 
so let's let's um go one step further so we can use the the theta angle to encode a information for example your pixel values your speech signal etc etc and then we use a parameterized gate to rotate the encoded state and then we do the measure so we can write these uh, uh, accurate uh, operations in the matrix form and if we do the measurement then we will have um, probabilities uh, finding it is state zero or state one with their corresponding probability and these probabilities actually the square or the absolute value of the amplitude Okay, so, so if you are doing a, say, classification tasks, then this already gives you the result, right? The label, uh, the probability for, for label zero or the label one. But if we randomly initialize a quantum circuit, fine, then we will not get the desired result. So we need uh, some way to to change the uh these uh five angles, so we can do it iteratively, and um and the first part is the quantum encoding, so um a general NQB state can be represented as this, and the encoding is a, 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 a circuit procedure that will transform your input data into this uh, complex amplitude of each computational basis. And there are different kinds of uh, encoding method and different encoding method have their strengths and weakness. For example, the amplitude encoding can theoretically compress the n-dimensional vector into log n qubit system, but it is generally harder to implement the real hardware. For the variational encoding is much simpler. So you use your original input X to Xn as the quantum rotation angles. So we have the variational circuit and we know how to encode the classical value into a quantum state. And then we also know that we can have the output from the quantum circuit for the process by classical or other quantum models, then we can um, uh, build a very uh, complex architectures like this. So this is the uh, hybrid quantum classical paradigm. So multiple components can be connected in a way such that a directed acyclic graph is formed. So it must be uh, acyclic and um, in theory, the whole model can be trained in an end-to-end -end manner. And we, we already know how to calculate the gradients of classical components. The next um, big question is how to calculate the gradient of a quantum node. So this is a quantum node, a very simple quantum node. And we again, we have encoding and uh, learnable or variational part and the measurement. So when we load some input vector x and uh, the, the encoded state will get through the, the variational part and then we do the measurement so we can have the observables. And uh, based on the, the work uh, from uh, uh, Mitara Lee from Osaka University, I believe, they show that the this quantum function uh, can be used to calculate the gradient uh, using this simple formula called parameter shift rule. So the basic idea is that the, if you want to calculate the gradient of a quantum function with respect to a particular parameter, theta i, then what you need to do is calculating two circuits and you, with parameter theta i plus pi over two and minus pi over two. 
And do not confuse this with the finite difference method because here you, uh, you don't need the infinitesimal part. So this is by its nature more numerically stable. And okay, so now you know how to calculate the, uh, the gradient of a quantum function, then you can put all the things together and use automatic differentiation that we use in the classical machine learning. So for example, we have a very, very simple example here. So first we want to do uh, X plus Y and we load this result into a quantum circuit Q and then uh, do some final processing. So uh, this is the so-called forward uh, differentiation. When we calculate uh, each step, we will uh, also store their uh, uh, differentiation in the memory so that we can use the chain rule to calculate the, the gradients of each parameters. For example, here, when we calculate the, uh, when we want to calculate the gradients with respect to x, then we can uh, calculate uh, dx of dx or dy of dx. And then when we uh, have v equals x plus y, then we know how to calculate dv over dx. And uh, we gradually accumulate this information and then we can calculate the du of dx very easily. So let's have some examples. So the first thing of course is the classification. And um, the very first thing I think is from uh, this paper in the uh, 2018 called Quantum Circuit Learning. So in, in this paper, the authors uh, provide a um, quantum circuit. Uh, here they use a, um, um, a, a bunch of circuit to encode the, the input data. And then they use several single qubit rotation to rotate the, the system. And then they finally uh, observe the Z expectation value. So uh, what they did is um, the very simple nonlinear classification task uh, in the, I think this in the scikit-learn data set. And they show that uh, the quantum circuit can be used to, to classify. The, the important thing is that they provide this framework and they provide that parameter shift rule to calculate the gradient of uh, the quantum circuit so that the quantum model can be trained just like uh, classical models. And so we can further um, uh, improve or, or stack several layers of those quantum circuits together. So this is the quantum version of convolutional neural network. So in the classical CNN, you know that there are small uh, filters or kernels and these filters or kernel will scan over the input image. And then, uh, it will uh, uh, have the, the, the higher level uh, extracted features. So the quantum, a very simple idea in the quantum is that we use some quantum circuit to replace that, say the kernels or the filters of the convolutional, classical convolutional neural network. And we use this small circuit to scan over the, the large image. So for example, if you have a cube by two filter, then what we need is a four to system. And we can use this to scan over the images and do classification. And in this work, uh, I try some examples from the high energy physics scattering, um, but but the, the idea is just that we want to use the quantum CNN to classify different events. 
So you can see that this is very simple to classify the say cats versus dogs or or handwritten digits. And we show that the the quantum version of CN can beat the the classical ones. Uh, when when both of them have similar architecture and similar number of parameters. So this is a very important constraint because we have very limited quantum uh, um, resources at the moment. And we cannot run very, very deep circuits or large number of qubits. So we don't expect that, say a very simple Quantum model with probably several hundred parameters can be deep CNN such as the VGG or ResNet or even bigger. So we need to uh, set the a proper uh, comparison. And another uh, work is that uh, we can also do quantum classification in a federated manner. Because there are several data sets that are proprietary and probably there are several privacy issues prevent us from releasing the data. For example, financial data, medical data, and a lot of, a lot of others. And so, uh, so we propose these kinds of federated quantum machine learning. So in uh, each local uh, node, they hold their own data and they have their own uh, quantum model, their small quantum model. They train using the data, uh, their, their own data, and they share their trained model to the central server. And the central server will just aggregate the parameters from each local node and then distribute the trained models or aggregated model to all these nodes. And we can show that um, with even one local training epoch in the local node, we can have a, a very similar performance to the uh, non-federated learning using all the data. And um, in addition to the privacy preserving features, we can also see that uh, you can use several small quantum computers to do a bigger machine learning test. And then let's talk about the sequential learning or the function approximation. So first we, we get back to the original 2018 paper from Itarai. And uh, they show that they can use the very similar circuit uh, used for classification to learn very simple functions such as the y equals x square, uh, exponential x, sine x, and the x absolute to the value of x. But what if we want to learn more complex structures? And so in the classical machine learning, we have the, the recurrent neural network. And there are several variants of the recurrent neural network. One of them is the LSTN. The LSTN probably dominates the sequential learning and language learning before the invention of transformers. So we try to uh, build a quantum version of the LSTN here. And the very simple way to do this is to just replace all the classical neural networks in the LSTN with the, the variational quantum circuit. So we can use this model to learn uh, more difficult tasks such as the, the damp symbol harmonic motion, the basal functions and uh, other uh, uh, quantum control or quantum optics problem. For example, the in the right hand side, the this problem has a uh, uh, high frequency part and a low frequency part, and we see that although the quantum and the classical models can both learn them, the uh, 
the, we observe that the quantum versions can get to the optimal results much faster. But, but usually training a quantum recurrent neural network is really slow. So uh, we want to do something that uh, we can still learn the sequence, but we don't want to train all the parameters. And in the classical computing, there is a idea called reservoir computing. So um, for example, you use a physical reservoir or a classical recurrent neural network or other uh, devices as a reservoir and you map your, your sequence into a high dimensional space. And after the transformation, you only train the, the, the regression or classification layer. You don't need to train the whole, uh, the reservoir or the recurrent neural network. So, so we just ask, can we use the quantum recurrent neural network as the reservoir? Because if we can do this, then we can use the quantum recurrent neural network without actually training all the quantum parameters. So uh, that's what we did. And it is really similar to the quantum LSTN, but we didn't train all these VQC parameters. And we can show that um, the performance is pretty similar to the fully trained QSTM, although it requires more epochs to reach the best performance. But I think it's within expectation, right? Because we, we reduce a lot of training. So there's, there are some trade-offs, uh, but if we can accept the, this, or if we can tolerate this discrepancy, then it's fine. At least it is much, much faster than the original training method. Okay, so um, next we will talk about the reinforcement in one. The reinforcement in is a type of machine learning that enables an agent to learn in an interactive environment while trying and error. And this is different from the supervised learning or unsupervised learning. For example, in the supervised learning we just mentioned, we have labels, we have the, the sequential, uh, we have the prediction target. But in the reinforcement, learning, we don't have this. The agent can only play with the environment and get the reward and state step by step. So the goal is that the agent want to maximize the total discounted return in an episode. And um, the, the very early content reinforcement learning is this. So imagine that you have a a quantum agent and um and you want to um learn in the environment but we cannot directly calculate the gradient on the quantum computer so we need uh, our hybrid quantum classical method and we use this classical optimization from the classical machine learning to optimize the the circuits in the in the quantum agent Since we can calculate the gradient of the quantum circuit, then we can uh, train the model to do the Q learning, the policy gradient learning, et cetera, et cetera. And the first thing that uh, in testing is the, called the frozen state environment. So there are 16 states because this is a four by four grid and we can encode these discrete state space into number Z, uh, zero to 15. And we change these numbers into binary representation so that we can use a four qubit system to represent this. At that time, when I uh, do this project is 2019 and um, the quantum simulators are not as good as today. So uh, simulating a four QB system is uh, is fine, but 
but it's not that easy to simulate. For example, say a uh, 16 qubit system, if you want to use the, the one hard encoding to encode the, the, the state space. And um, the next um, improvement for this quantum Q learning is that uh, we can consider using a, a recurrent neural network in, in the reinforcement agent because many real world environments are partially observable, meaning that the agent can only receive partial information of the world. It cannot um, get all the information required to, to uh, make the decisions. So one way to, to solve this task is that the agent need to keep track of its past experience. And we need a model that can uh, that memorize. Um, so it's difficult to do it using the 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 feed forward network, but we can do it using the the recurrent neural network, and we use the quantum LCN uh, mentioned before in in this kind of model, and we can show that uh, compared to a uh, similar model in the classical LSTM. The similar model means that we set the uh, number of parameters very similar. We show that um, the, the quantum model can reach higher or more stable scores after the training. But the previously mentioned quantum IR suffers from an issue. The training is really slow because they only use single-threaded training. And an idea from the classical RL is that we can do a synchronous training. So we launch several parallel agents at the same time, and each agent, each um, agent will interact with its own copy of the environment and gain the experience and share the learning results. So we uh, generalize this idea into the quantum reinforcement world. The idea is that imagine that you have several small quantum machines, but we use simulator. So for example, we have 80 CPU cores. So you imagine that you have 80 quantum computers small quantum computers running on each CPU course. And, and each process, each agent will interact with the result of the environment. And, and it will have, it will gain its trajectory, that is experience. And they use the, those experience to update their local model. So meaning that calculate the gradients of the model. And then they only share the gradients to the global parameter. So the global parameter will be updated based on the update uploaded uh, gradients. And then this model will be uh, shared. I mean, the, the, local, the local model will, or the local agent will download that updated uh, global model and use it to do the next round of uh, learning. And the point here is that each of the node or each of the agent can do this asynchronously so they don't need to wait for others finishing their part. So this largely um, increased the training speed. And we also show that uh, for this standard benchmark test, um, the, the asynchronous training of quantum IR can beat the, the classical counterpart. Again, the, the, the classical counterpart is said to be very similar as the quantum one, because again, as I mentioned before, you cannot use a quantum model with several hundred parameters to beat a classical model with millions of parameters. 
And there are uh, other uh, more uh, quantum IR works there. And the final application that I want to mention is the natural language processing. The first is the speech recognition. So um, there are several uh, privacy concerns here. And what we want to do is that, so first you have the, the signal and you can process into the male spectrum. And, and this thing can be sent to the, a, a quantum convolutional layer in the cloud. So using a randomly initialized quantum circuit to encode the, the male spectra, the features, and then and then the this quantum encoded uh, features can further be processed by the traditional recurrent neural network, attention recurrent neural network. And this can be used to reduce the model parameter degrees. And another uh, thing is to use the, the BERT model to uh, first process the text, input text, and, and the, the encoded um, uh, features can be used to um, uh, pro can be processed by the uh, temporal quantum temporal convolutional neural network, and then uh, do the classification test. And we we also uh, try different kinds of embeddings such as word vector bird, and uh, different um data sets such as eighty seven and SNPs, and we can find that the quantum temporal convolutional model can provide a, a better uh, performance compared to the classical ones. And all of these things can be uh, implemented using these op uh, open source tools such as the QSKI, TensorFlow Quantum, and the Pennyman. And for simulations, probably you will need to use some something more faster. For example, the, the QLEX, uh, which supports multi-core multi -core computation and Q content, which is from NVIDIA. Uh, you can use, you can simulate the quantum model on the GPUs. Yeah, so uh, the, to conclude today's talk, so the leading uh, quantum machine learning model proposals are the hybrid quantum classical paradigm. And and this method is to use classical computers to optimize quantum circuit parameters. And the basic building block called variation of quantum circuit or parameterized quantum circuit can be used to process the encoded classical data. And the VQC can, uh, can be uh, integrated into the existing classical machine learning workflow. And the whole model can be trained using the gradient descent method. And the gradients of these frequencies can be calculated using the parameter shift rule. And so overall, the auto differentiation that we are already familiar with can be used, again, in the quantum machine learning. And those kinds of model are shown to be successful in, for example, the, the sequential learning, classification, generated learning, natural language processing, and reinforcement learning. Uh, thank you. That's uh, my today's talk.